Hey, hey everyone. We are back for the next session with Jeff Robbins. So I'm just going to make sure everybody comes uh, quickly back to the session and everybody's in. Um, you can say if you're all ready. <laughs> so um, our next speaker is uh, Jeff Robbins. He is the founder of Yonder. It's a podcast about remote work, and he also is also the former. He's also the former CEO of Lotabot. It's a web development agency that works entirely remotely, and this is what he's going to be talking to us about today. So uh, he's going to basically talk about how he's been managing his team completely remotely. So I'd like to go ahead, and I'm going to bring Jeff to the screen. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having uh, me. Pleasure. I'm uh, just going to remind also again people to use the Q&A section below. Also reminding you also of our code of conduct. We wrote a code of conduct on the website just to make sure that we stay uh, pretty nice on the, on the chat and we don't not go too <laughs> spammy. So I just want to remind people that we have a code of conduct, of conduct and please be nice in the chat. So um, use the Q&A section to ask your question. I'm going to see you in 30 minutes for uh, the Q&A section, sex session with, um, with Jeff. So let's go ahead, Jeff. I'm going to hide myself. And now the spiritual stage is yours. Great. Uh, are you seeing my slides OK? Let's just assume that she's saying yes. Yes, uh, it's here. It's uh, up there. I see PF management distributed. Great. That's, that's what it should be. That's what should be happening. We're, we're good. It's all happening. All right. Great. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about managing remote teams. Uh, but first, uh, I'm Jeff Robbins. Uh, um, you can find me at, if you have questions about the talk, feel free to email me, jeff at yonder.io or at jjeff on Twitter and most of the social medias, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and whatnot. Um, I'm probably best known as the co-founder of Lullabot. Uh, Lullabot's a fully distributed company, started in 2006. Um, however, I've left Lullabot uh, earlier this year, uh, and I'm focusing pretty much full-time these days on Yonder, uh, which is a well, started as a conference. Actually, we're running a conference again this year. Uh, it's sort of a roundtable conference for leaders of distributed companies, uh, remote teams, and people who are uh, company leaders who want to figure out how to do remote um, and stuff like that. You can find out more about that at yonder.io slash events. Um, as Daphne mentioned, um, we also have a podcast that's uh, I think we've got 15 episodes that we've been putting out every other week for about a year now. Uh, and uh, uh, you can find that also at yonder.io, but you can find it on the uh, iTunes store and wherever you find better podcasts. Um, it's really fun. Uh, we talk about the kinds of stuff that I'm about to talk about and talk with people that uh, uh, run distributed companies and remote teams. Uh, we've got a newsletter too, uh, yonder.io slash newsletter. Uh, sign up for the newsletter and you, we'll let you know about all that other stuff and you don't even need to remember what I just said. Uh, so yeah, so Yonder uh, kind of started with this mission of helping to spread remote work. Uh, um, we, we do consulting and, um, and we provide we're sort of providing more and more different uh, things as time goes on. I've got a couple employees and we're still kind of expanding on, on what we do. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I'm probably best known uh, um, for starting Lullabot. Um, uh, well, hold on, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, let me catch up with my slides. So I'm writing a book. Uh, I started writing a book a few years ago. Eh, it's been going on and off, uh, fits and starts kind of thing. But one of the things that I came up with was trying to encapsulate the management work that was happening at Lullabot, right? How were we managing our team? Uh, Lullabot is a uh, fully distributed company. Um, we try not to call it remote because there's no office. It's not removed from anything. No one is remote from anything. They're distributed. They're spread out. Um, uh, basically, everyone at Lullabot are employees for the most part. Uh, we are dedicated to them. They are dedicated to us. We've got a really strong company culture. We've got a really highly skilled and highly respected team. Uh, they're not freelancers. Um, so, 
this is not the gig economy. This is kind of um, replicating, you know, what we've come to think of as a company workplace, but in a remote and distributed environment. So uh, people have job security and stuff like that. So I just sort of want to explain that part of things as I talk about this, because that's sort of the perspective I'm coming from uh, when, when I talk about this. So, um, so there's that. In the longer version of this talk, uh, I talk about, you know, sort of take a little bit of a look at uh, co-located companies, sort of how they've, how they've been over, over history, right? So from back from a real like traditional kind of office-based company uh, through sort of today's more non-traditional uh, open office kind of uh, environment that you see in startups and, uh, and stuff like that. I'm going to talk, uh, kind of focus today on the distributed company aspect of it, um, but I'll also sort of contrast it uh, with how things work uh, in a more um, co-located uh, environment um, uh, as, as we go along. So I'm kind of whipping through here to get through all of this in a half an hour. But So in a distributed co company, kind of what's different than uh, working in a uh, co-located brick and mortar company. Um, one thing that's probably particularly noticeable, uh, although maybe not as conscious for someone who's transitioning, a, a worker who's, who's come to a remote company, is that there's very little nonverbal communication. There's not a whole lot. When you walk through uh, an office, you've got a new job and a new office, you kind of walk through and you kind of can get a feel for who does what and what's where and where is my desk and uh, when do people go to lunch and all that kind of sort of all this nonverbal stuff, right? There's also sort of uh, even stuff like uh, deference, who, who seems to look up to whom, and who dresses better than who and all that kind of stuff. The, the, all these nonverbal things really play uh, into uh, a lot of the communication that happens at a co-located company, um, but in a distributed company, they don't really happen, uh, which oftentimes is actually a good thing. Uh, we need to be intentional about our communication and we can kind of control a lot of the sort of little nits and picks and uh, sort of office politics kind of stuff that tend to come up uh, at, at uh, co-located companies. Uh, instead, we need to be intentional. We need to be proactive about our communication at a distributed company. Uh, most of our communication is archived or archivable. Uh, in a co-located company, oftentimes communication is happening real time. Uh, I'll stop by your desk and we'll have a quick conversation or uh, we'll, you know, take a conference room and have a meeting. And maybe someone's taking notes, but it's not quite archived in the same way as uh, email threads are or turning on recording uh, on a conference line or, or a, a video conference or, or something like that. So um, at a distributed company, most of the communication that's happening is very asynchronous, right? Uh, that's sort of what we think of when we think of uh, remote work is, is, you know, work coming in through emails or uh, GitHub message boards, whatever your, your uh, project management uh, system of choice is Asana, whatever. Uh, and, um, uh, and so uh, it all happens kind of as asynchronously at a distributed company, at least that's sort of the basis of things, um, which also means that a lot of the communication can be syndicated. So uh, again, sort of going back to the traditional uh, co-located company, uh, if I want to do a presentation, talk to the entire company. Usually we get in that conference room, but if it's a bigger company, now I need an auditorium. Uh, whereas in a distributed company, uh, we can, right now I'm talking to 1200 plus people uh, and we can do it this way, or I can send an email or a memo and it's easy to send it to everyone. Uh, uh, the, if a con conference call can be recorded, we can have people in different time zones, uh, different parts of the world who can catch up with it and stuff like that. And the other thing that's really interesting about a distributed company is that micromanagement is basically impossible. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, this is, this is a good thing for those of us who have been remote workers. Uh, but oftentimes it's really a thing that, um, that managers, conventional brick and mortar managers kind of go to as a place to like, 
when they get nervous, they're like, I'll, I'll just micromanage. I'll just watch my people really closely and make sure that they're doing the work right. And to know that they can't do that oftentimes makes this transition to uh, being a distributed company or having a remote team uh, kind of difficult for um, for conventional uh, managers. Uh, distributed is a discipline. Um, this is a thing I've been saying for several years now. I call it remote work. I call remote work uh, ankle weights for management, right? Uh, it's like, uh, these are just really good management philosophies that are kind of good for everyone. It's a little bit harder to do it first, but boy, if you can do it, if you can get your head around this, this isn't just techniques that work really well for remote work, but kind of for everyone. Uh, there's a great book that I read uh, several years ago called uh, Drive uh, by a guy named Dan Pink. Uh, I highly recommend that everyone read it. It's a really great book uh, that I refer to oftentimes when sort of thinking about kind of what are the motivators, like what drives people, what makes people feel good uh, uh, and feel uh, rewarded in the things that they do. Um, and in this book, Dan Pink talks about this idea of autonomy, mastery, and purpose as these intrinsic motivators that are kind of built into people, sort of beyond the kind of normal uh, uh, stuff that we think about, um, you know, the need to survive and eat and things like that. Uh, these are these higher purpose kinds of kinds of motivators. But as a manager, uh, we need, while we need to understand that, it's not, these aren't something that we can provide, right? Uh, and so I got on this idea of external motivators and I went back and kind of looked at the way that things had been happening at Lullabot uh, over the past 11 years and, uh, and came up with this idea of, uh, of purpose, information, autonomy, and feedback, right? Uh, these are things that we can give. We can give purpose, we can give information, we can give autonomy, and we can give feedback to people as a way of helping to better manage them and kind of dovetail in with those intrinsic motivators uh, to help people to just feel good and feel supported. Um, and this is PIAF, right? Purpose, information, autonomy, and feedback. And it's a cycle. It's a circle. Well, this is a square, but it's a, it's a cycle. Uh, and it happens to share a name. I don't know if we have anyone from France here uh, with the famous uh, Edith Piaf, uh, famed French cabaret singer and actress who died in 1963. She's generally considered to be one of the greatest performers of the 20th century. Uh, however, she has pretty much nothing to do with um, the Piaf method other than that you know, she's pretty great and uh and and hopefully this is pretty great too so uh and it helps you to be uh, a little bit uh, easier to remember piaf uh it's got that name of that french cabaret singer so uh so let's sort of go around and talk about each of these purpose information autonomy and feedback let's start with purpose um so we want to provide purpose for people as managers. We want to give meaning to their work. We want them to understand how they fit into the whole of the company and the work that we're doing. Uh, we talk about intentionality, right? On purpose, do something on purpose. Aspiration, things having a higher purpose. Uh, we talk about the why, the Simon Sinek uh, TED talk, where we want to get to the why. Um, this, this idea of clarity of purpose and having clear goals and also clear roles, I think, are something that, uh, that can really contribute to giving people an understanding of purpose. Purpose also happens on different levels, sort of different Zoom levels, uh, different levels of scale. So on the smallest scale level, it's happening on the individual level. So what is my individual purpose uh, as a, a, a worker at the company? And I think that this happens uh, kind of right off the bat with the job description. When you apply for a job, you're matching what you want to be your purpose in life uh, with what a company wants is as the purpose for their company. Uh, we're looking for a writer. We're looking for a designer. We're looking for a developer. And so, you know, you, you match that and the company kind of puts it out there. Here's, here's what purpose we would like you to serve. And I think that it's really important with, with a lot of these things, but purpose in particular, to really document things really well. 
Uh, and so it starts with this posted job description, but I think it needs to even kind of move on from there. Once you've found the best candidate from the job and perhaps, and you've hired that person, uh, uh, I think the job description should become a collaborative process and maybe take that document uh, that you that you posted uh, online and uh, and put it into a Google Doc. And now we've got someone uh, and 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 this person knows what they like to do, what they want to do. Uh, the company, the pe people from the company, the management, uh, company leadership uh, knows what the, the job that needs to be done is. And I think it should be a collaborative process of people kind of documenting, uh, uh, you know, coming up with a job description together uh, that kind of ultimately meets the, the purpose and, and needs of, of the company, but also accommodates uh, people's individual uh, purpose. Um, goals, this is another thing to talk about uh, with new employees and ongoing, like, what are your goals? What do you want to be uh, in the future? What do you want to do in the future? How, do, how would you like to expand and grow? Um, and I think even uh, a job title can be can be a collaborative process uh, um, that uh, um, it might you know you want to kind of allow for the goals if a person wants to be the VP of the company but they're just starting in an entry level job uh, let's give them the entry level job uh, and you know as they uh, but we can keep in mind and check in on those goals of of becoming a VP of the company as as time goes on. Um, Purpose is kind of zooming out to the next level of scale. Um, uh, this won't happen at a, at a lot of companies. I think Lullaby as a 65 person agency is kind of just starting to get there where, uh, where there's also an identity that happens on a sort of a group or department level. Uh, but I know at larger companies, uh, you know, there's a lot of identity that happens on the, on the department level. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, they, you would want to talk about purpose on that level. Ultimately, it kind of mirror company purpose, uh, or at least the method for, for company purpose. So I'll just talk about that. Um, there's a really great book, another really great book uh, called Tribal Leadership um, that talks about uh, ultimately kind of this idea of purpose, of, of companies uh, being able to find their higher purpose and how it sort of uh, it creates different types of cultures at, at different types of companies. I would recommend that book as well. Um, so, but when we talk about company purpose, let's some, come up with some sort of tangibles. What, how can we, how can we create the purpose? What can we write down? What, what are the, what are the things that we can do? Uh, the first one that's probably most common when we talk about this kind of stuff and sort of company culture, company purpose uh, is, is core values. Um, I think that these need to kind of emanate out of uh, who a company is, who's a co who a company, uh, um, you know, actually is not necessarily who they want to be. Uh, it should be, you know, something that's kind of captured out of the storytelling of the company and, uh, and stuff like that. But uh, if, you're, if you're curious to see Lullabot's core values, you can go to lullabot.com slash values uh, and see Lullabot's core values there. Uh, we've also got our mission statement there. Um, I think this can also be a really great rallying cry. Uh, one of my favorite mission statements um, at this point uh, is a is a two word mission statement from SpaceX, uh, which is colonize Mars, and basically you know the whole company just sort of falls in line behind it. It's it's really amazing. It's like yeah yeah this is what we're doing. We're trying to you know get to Mars and then get people to Mars and and colonize it. It's a really big hairy audacious goal, uh, but but a, but a good thing to kind of really rally people and kind of help people to understand their purpose. Vision um, is another thing. It's a little bit more abstract than core values and mission statement um, tends to be a little bit less public, but it's sort of, you know, um, how, how people are sort of sharing, uh, you know, just the, the company leadership having, having vision and sort of sharing its ideas and, um, it's a it's a little bit more fluid, and again, this idea of of a company having and trying to find its higher purpose and sort of where it sits in the universe, whether we're this is the company that's colonizing Mars or just the company that's going to make the best WordPress websites or have the best uh, customer support or the best uh, you know 
um, user experience or, or whatever those kind of things are. I think that uh, companies can can find that higher purpose, and especially in a in you know when you've got remote workers, this stuff just really helps to align people, um, especially people who are working uh, alone and by themselves sometimes to to make decisions and kind of know uh, how to how to proceed with their work. The next item uh, in our P off cycle is information. So information is oftentimes uh, referred to as transparency. I, I called it information because it's a little more all encompassing than just transparency specifically, right? Uh, um, it's also sort of the archive of information, the raw materials, um, and all the stuff that sort of compensates for that nonverbal uh, communication stuff that happens at a co-located company. Uh, it might even include things like a, you know, company hierarchy and structure, uh, or, um, you know, a, a, I don't know, really good handbook that explains like how to advance in the company. Um, you know, um, I'll talk some more about other other examples of that. Um, we're also compensating for peripheral information. So, uh, you know, that kind of stuff of like, uh, you know, when you started at a, at a co-located company, there's like the time of day that people go for lunch and, uh, or, or whatever, you know. And so how, in a distributed company, how can you kind of fill in, to, do you need to fill in that information? You know, like just to help people understand like, how they should be. And this information happens in both a synchronous and asynchronous kind of way. I think oftentimes we think of it as an asynchronous kind of archived way. We need to create a handbook or something like that. But it also uh, is oftentimes very ongoing uh, as we check in. Maybe we've got a company uh, all hands call once a week or once a month. We've got a, um, a, um, a town hall meeting or something like that, you know, where, where it's a little bit more interactive um, uh, kind of way of getting out the information about a, a company. So we can provide information, uh, you know, audio and video, uh, conference lines, Slack, IRC messaging, um, know your company is a really nice tool uh, that we've used at Lullabot for a couple of years now and, and really like, uh, this is an email based tool. Uh, that just kind of keeps conversation going. It kind of keeps the information flowing and not just necessarily work stuff, but also kind of company culture stuff. Like what are, what are people into? What do they like to do? What do their kids do? You know, understanding all that peripheral information uh, that can get lost uh, in a distributed company environment. Internet and wikis are really great for just sort of throwing in a lot of a lot of stuff about the about the company, about the work, about the projects, uh, and to have it out there so that it's you know searchable, findable uh, by people who are who are doing the work. Um, and then you know the stuff that we're probably most of us are more familiar with, uh, project management kind of tools, uh, uh, code management, like GitHub, Basecamp, message boards, stuff like that. Um, I mentioned the company handbook. I think that that can be a really good thing for providing that sort of information, like really deep uh, level of information for people to sort of understand and get a feel for uh, the company, regular updates, uh, internal blog, internal podcast, company calls. Um, business transparency is another one. Uh, you know, t companies tend to really run the gamut on this. Um, We've got, you know, companies, especially in that sort of gig economy, freelance kind of thing, companies that are very tight lipped and uh, are, are sending, here's the work uh, and we're not going to tell you anything about the company or what we're doing. Uh, always be beware of that one. Um, uh, we had uh, 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 Bree Reynolds from uh, Flex Jobs on the, on a, the Yonder podcast uh, a while back and she was talking about... Um, remote work scams. And it was really interesting, you know, to this kind of thing. Basically, you know, we're building trust here. The more that you can share, the more that we're going to build trust. And it's really hard to build trust in a, in a distributed environment. Um, so, you know, we've got companies that have open salaries. Lullabot has uh, open books, not completely open, but we share on a monthly basis, kind of the ups and downs of the company. And man, it transformed the company completely. Like, uh, uh, you know, it used to feel just like we, uh, uh, in the leadership position, we're kind of carrying the weight of the company. But as we started opening the books uh, and also opening uh, the sales pipeline to share with everyone at the company kind of what was going on, 
everyone in the company kind of banded together and it created this really cohesive environment uh, for us all to solve these problems together. And it was really, really rewarding. And again, we're building trust. We're building understanding. That's why we want to share all this information. It can be a little overwhelming, but some of it will just kind of, you know, wash over people. It will be sort of peripheral information. Uh, I was reading about, you know, companies with uh, open salaries po policies where there's, you know, a, a Google Doc or something that everyone at the company has access to. But the truth is that, like, most people don't actually open it and look at it they're, they're very often. But just knowing that it's there is actually really important. Um, and we, again, we're empowering uh, remote workers to make decisions, uh, to be able to decide things on their own uh, if they are unable to get in touch with other people at the company. Um, so we've got the P, purpose, the I, information, now the A, which is autonomy. Um, so let's talk about autonomy. This is in some ways the easiest thing to talk about, but also some, for some people the, the most difficult, right? Because autonomy is synonymous with remote work. If you're going to be a remote worker, you are going to work autonomously. You're going to work on your own. You're going to need to have that freedom uh, and be given that freedom. And it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, autonomy is also synonymous with trust. And, but this is where it gets to be a little bit of a, a roadblock for conventional managers sometimes and sort of a source of fear because for people who are used to being able to fall back on micromanagement, you know, letting people go and be free, how do you know that they won't uh, take advantage of that? Um, how do you know that, they, that, that aut the aut autonomy can't, you know, won't go in the wrong direction? And even in a more empathetic way, uh, you know, autonomy also is a bit synonymous with isolation. And so how can we be sure that as a manager, I'm not isolated, but also the workers are not, you know, the people who are doing the work are not isolated and, and lost. Um, and so I think that, that uh, autonomy needs to happen in a supported kind of way, right? It's a, it's a connected, uh, more collaborative kind of autonomy. Um, and so we also, you know, so we need to uh, let let remote workers know that there's a, a support network for them, uh, that they've got Slack and phone calls and places that they can ask questions and get help. And if we're going to ask them to ask questions, we need to also create a culture of vulnerability, right? We need to make it to be okay at the company to say when you don't know how something's going. And we need to accept that uh, and not create that sort of a competitive culture uh, where if anyone uh, admits that they don't know, know something, it's a, uh, you know, uh, Achilles heel point of vulnerability. Um, and, and we need to embrace this autonomy. This is, this is who we are. This is what makes us uh, special as well. But the truth is that, uh, Pretty much every company I've talked to, uh, you can try to, you know, onboard people. Um, I've talked to in, on the podcast several companies who have a um, central office, and when they're hiring people, they bring them into the central office and, you know, give them an onboarding process. But ultimately, at some point, you just need to throw people out into the deep end and kind of kind of see how they do. And, and that's just part of it. And, and it's also okay to be open about that and say, yeah, we're going to throw you in the deep end. And if you start, you know, going underwater, let us know and uh, we'll help and we'll keep correcting. Um, so it's a collaborative autonomy process. We're creating trust, right? And uh, we also, you know, we need to hire trustworthy people. That's, that's oftentimes, again, uh, when I talk to managers of co-located companies, they say, how, how are you going to trust your people? Uh, and the answer is kind of simple. It's like, well, hire trustworthy people. Screen for that. Look for people, like, like look for that being a, a skill of people who you hire. Hire trustworthy people. Um, create clear goals and measurements of success so that there's some metrics on like, you know, you're, you're heading out uh, uh, from point A where we are now and you're going to, you know, uh, go out into the wilderness and, uh, and here's where we expect you to end up at the end. What, what, what will success look like? Um, and then just expect trustworthiness. I've, I've found that, uh, you know, uh, uh, people will usually rise to the occasion when given, uh, given trust. Um, and then the last part of, of the PF cycle is feedback. Um, 
feedback is also known as accountability, uh, support. I think that it's important that there's a practice of gratitude that happens in the feedback process. Uh, but ultimately, we're kind of checking in with the results uh, that, like I said, you know, people head out from point A. Did they get to point B successfully? How did the journey go? Uh, uh, we want to check in with their goals, check in to find out what their blockers were, and check in with purpose. Remember, we documented the purpose. We documented their goals. Like, how is it going? Uh, uh, how, how are we doing? Uh, do we need to adjust? Um, and we just want to check in on a regular basis. And this happens also at levels of scale. It's a, it's a fractal process. This is a, is a big brother. This is a support process, uh, but it's about, you know, hearing and understanding. So we want probably some kind of daily updates, daily check-ins. Maybe they just happen on Slack or, or you know, uh, message board of some kind or something like that to just sort of like, hey, how, you know, let me know how you're doing. Uh, but it could also happen is more like a scrum call for people who are familiar with the agile development methodology. Uh, um, but also uh, weekly reviews, weekly reviews a little bit longer, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour kind of thing. Monthly check-ins and reviews uh, to sort of see where we're at. And then annual or, or biannual, you know, usually longer, hour, two hour long, kind of like, let's check in on how we're doing. How are you doing? How are we doing? Uh, and, and readjust. Let's readjust if necessary. Let's go back to those collaborative documents, to the job description, to the job title, uh, to the goals, um, and see, you know, what, what's, what's going on? Are we, are we on track? Have, have those changed? Uh, do we need, is there some professional development that needs to happen? Are there, uh, um, is there some support that could happen and stuff like that? So, and then you go back around again. Uh, so we're back to purpose again. So we're checking in on purpose and tweaking that. And, um, and this is the cycle, uh, the PIAF cycle. Um, I think it's just really important, like, we want to remember and support uh, a sense of importance for people. Uh, they need to remember, uh, you know, as, as managers, and especially as remote workers, they need to know, everyone needs to know uh, that they're important to us, because they are important. Uh, for anyone that's started a company, like, you can't do it on your, you can't do it all by yourself, you can't do it on your own. Um, uh, and so, I think, again, this culture of gratitude uh, is, is important and just sort of letting people know uh, where they stand. Um, I think really, as I mentioned, oftentimes workers can be treated as a commodity and we want to get away from that. So anyways, there you go. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was very valuable information and I hope that everybody uh, agree with me that all this information was very interesting for people who want to know how to be better at managing a remote company. So Thank you so much for this. And I want to go ahead and start having some questions in the Q&A. There's a bunch of questions I really want us to answer, especially the one from Nayla Rodriguez. Uh, last time she asked a question and I completely forgot to select her. So <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that I'm answering her question. So uh, she said, hi, Jeff. Uh, can you let us know what you think of platforms for remote works like uh, Upwork, Freelancer, People Per Hour, all these kind of platforms for getting remote jobs? Yeah, I, honestly, I don't know too much about them. Um, we've tried to sort of stay away from the more freelancer kind of thing at Lullabot. Um, actually, with Yonder, we're starting to to use some of those. Uh, some I've got a couple of employees. We've been kind of expanding out Yonder as its own company, um, and it's nice to sort of uh, we're looking right now first a, a podcast editor to help with editing the podcast, and so we've been looking into into some of those kinds of things as well. I think it's really great that they exist. Um, it's you know my the the drum that I'm usually banging is is uh, about sort of culture and connectedness and um, uh, and sometimes those kinds of things can can be a lot more ephemeral. Uh, they kind of you know come and go. Uh, um, ultimately, though, we had someone from up uh, we had someone at the Yonder conference last year. The name of the company is escaping me, but it was really interesting to see how they, even though they were basically, you know, what we used to call a temp company, uh, um, were 
creating a company culture and all of that kind of stuff within within this freelancer uh, network uh, was really interesting to me. So, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe a lot of these kinds of things can happen there too. Mm. All right. I have another question from uh, Laurel. So um, I hear a lot about trust and culture in remote work. What is the difference and how can my team build each? Yeah, uh, culture is a funny one. Um, uh, for years, uh, uh, I, I knew a lot of people that worked at sort of San Francisco startups uh, um, and they would say things like, oh man, I work at this company. It's got a great culture. Um, they've got a beer fridge and a foosball table. And like, and, and on Friday we could just like stop working at two o'clock and drink beer. So like great culture, but I, that's not really culture. Like, I think culture is sort of the how people interact with one another, uh, how people kind of like feel about their jobs. It's it's very abstract, but uh, trust is a part of culture. And but companies can have a, a distrustful culture. Uh, um, at Lullabot, we we've had the opportunity to work with a lot of clients over time, and. There are definitely companies out there that, you know, have very distrustful culture with people keeping, you know, a box next to their desk because at any moment they either may quit in a, in a, in a huff of anger or be fired and, you know, and they're just sort of constantly living in fear. That's culture, right? Uh, and, um, and a lot of the stuff, I think, uh, you know, if you want to go read Lullabot's core values, uh, um, it's a really good example of kind of outlining, you know, how we want to be, who we want to be, um, and what our culture is. Um, and that's, it's different than trust. Trust plays into it, uh, but, uh, but uh, um, trust isn't necessarily culture on its own, um, but it definitely plays into the dynamic of remote work a lot. Mm. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. There's something with trust and it says in a suite, you don't actually, I was, I'm open, often saying that you don't need remote work necessarily, but the trust that, you know, in a, if some, some companies trust is really making a big, big difference than, um, you know, than just offering remote work as a perk. Well, and the idea of having trust or, or offering trust in a company is a relatively new idea, right? This is sort of, I really feel like this is where the future of work kind of comes in, mm -hmm. is this sort of collaborative kind of trust-based uh, kind of environment. Because uh, when you think about like the history of work, you know, you go way back to like, you know, indentured servitude, basically slave work, you know, like, mm -hmm trust like no you just stay away from the whip they're, they're cracking the whip and you need to stay away from it and then we sort of move into uh kind of the industrial re revolution and uh and you know this kind of more commoditized worker based kind of thing uh ultimately you know the workers kind of band together and create unions and and there's that kind of thing and but it's not it's not like individual trust and sort of value of the individual uh, in the way that we're kind of looking at these days. So Nice. Well, I totally agree with that. And the next um, question is from Marius. And uh, Marius, it's what kind of rituals do you have? Any daily, weekly, monthly activities that you regularly perform? Rituals. That makes it sound <laughs> more, more uh, specific. I think it is important to kind of let things be kind of fluid, you know, sort of let them happen how they happen, uh, but to show up and kind of be there, uh, but, but allow some agility to those processes. But um, uh, at Lullabot, for example, um, uh, you know, the, the teams that are working on a given uh, client project uh, will get together and do scrum calls on, a, on usually a daily basis, maybe twice or three times a week, um, but round about there. Uh, our uh, department managers are kind of checking in one-on-one -on -one with everyone on the team, uh, not on a daily basis, but, you know, for them it's on a daily basis, but, you know, for the team people, it's probably once a month, maybe twice a month, kind of just to check in, see how you're doing. Uh, weekly stuff, uh, again, sort of mirrors sort of the agile methodology where there's a, a weekly uh, review, you know, or maybe bi-weekly, you know, looking back at the two-week sprint kind of a thing. Uh, we also do, uh, um, Lullabot does weekly team calls uh, where everyone from the team gets on a, on a phone call together 
uh, and um, and just kind of shares what's going on with them. Like like a wide variety, you know. Uh, uh, you know, this weekend I I went with my kids and we went to the water slide. And this week I'm going to be working on this project for this client. And I don't know, it's just a really nice way to kind of get to mm -hmm. get to know everybody. Um, and then, uh, um, and then we also do annual uh, reviews. Um, and, and sometimes, it, you know, when people need them more frequently, we'll do them uh, more frequently as well. Uh, and, and it's just really great to keep that line of communication open um, to, you know, check in with people and, and we've had like kind of a formatted list of questions that gets more formal, um, mostly because we just don't want to miss anything, you know, oh, we forgot to ask people um, if they have any, you know, personal goals we should know about or, um, you know, things like that. Um, and it's really nice to check in with people, have these milestone times that you check in with people. It's like, hey, six months ago, you said you wanted to learn uh, more JavaScript development. How's that gone? Uh, can, can we help you with that? Uh, mm. Do you still want to do that? Um, stuff like that, I think, is, is really good all around. Yeah, professional development is really great when you have the opportunity to be able to do that in the company. Um, so we're done now with the Q&A. I have to uh, wrap this up for uh, setting up the next session. But thank you so much for being with yeah, us. Thanks, and, everyone. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you a lot. And uh, I think yeah. everybody is very excited as well. So I'm going to hide you now. And uh, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and exchange session. And also, we've been talking about agile methodology a lot in that one. And I'm just reminding you that we have another session about agile methodology. So if you want to hear more about it and understand better what it is, you can watch the session from Libby Barker. I'm going to change session now and see you back in five minutes. Bye, everyone. <laughs>